Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first and last word poetry series. And tonight we have Susan Donnelly, Richard Kaufman, and Christine Turney. And I'm very excited about tonight, and so is Harris. Harris will be introducing the readers, followed by a Q&A, and that's it. So I turn you over to Harris. Thank you, Gloria. And uh, welcome to all who are here tonight. And uh, you're in for a real treat, as, as we have every month a real treat. But uh, so our first uh, featured reader, Susan Donnelly, uh, her newest poetry is collection is the Maureen Papers and other poems. She's the author of Capture the Flag, Transit, Eve Names the Animals, and six chapbooks. Uh, she's widely published in journals, anthologies, uh, textbooks, and online. Uh, Susan teaches poetry in classes and uh, consultations from her home in Arlington, which is done for uh, time immemorial. <laughs> so <laughs> please welcome Susan Donnelly. Thank you, Harris. I feel very time immemorial a lot of the times, you know, these days. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and I thank you and Gloria for doing this wonderful series, and I'm glad to be a part of it. Yes, indeed, I do have a new book, The Maureen Papers and Other Poems, and I'm going to read mostly from that, particularly the, the uh, title poem, which is a sequence about um, my sister-in-law, Maureen. Um, but I'm going to start off with the first poem in my book, Transit, because I think it, I realized as I put this reading together, and even as I put the other manuscript together, that um, my, my themes remain, and this seemed to have a lot of the themes that was, were, uh, have appeared in the new book. Chanson on the Red Line. The heart opens in such unlikely places, a subway platform muffled in February, the train late, no one looking at anyone else. Then a song begins, parlez-moi d'amour, like a pink ribbon unwinding, from the young black man with guitar, whose throat trembles, who holds his head back, eyes half closed. We each look down into our own longings, familiar as the stations we daily travel, pressed up against strangers. Slowly we come forward to drop our thanks into his open case. We are shy, we, we don't want to be noticed, wanting so much. But who are we? Let me tell the truth for once. I walked here quickly through the dark street, a middle-aged woman carrying two bags. I wore a black and white cloak of impossibilities that smoked like dry ice. I'm waiting here, fresh from that swift and peopled solitude. I can love anyone. And I realized, as I said, in putting uh, this book together, I've written many poems of that kind that have to do with cities, that have to do with longing, the self in the city, the observations of the city, and our, our solitary uh, needs around us as we look around us. So I'm going to read two or three poems at the beginning of this book that may reflect some of that. This would be a city observation. The begging girl. The whole time I've sat here at the coffee shop window, no one's given her anything. It puts people off that jivey, almost dance as she comes up with a smile that says you and she share a joke. In her 20s, probably, good clothes, fresh-faced, but awry somehow, like the way she spoke just now as I came from the bank. Any sweeties or something like that I didn't quite catch. And startled, do I know her? I hurried past since it was pouring. Most people don't even stop. Only one starts to talk with her, then step by step backs away. Whenever the sidewalk's empty, she stops jigging, walks under rain in a slow circle. Her head is bent. She doesn't pull up her hood. The second poem, The Side Altars, 
reflects my Catholic background. In Catholic churches, there's a main altar, and then there's a, a Mary a altar with the statue of Mary, and on the other side, one of St. Joseph. And I, as I say in this, as a young teenager, really, spent an awful lot of time writing, you know, lighting wish candles or prayer candles in front of the Mary uh, statue. Again, that longing for love. The side altars. St. Joseph, at the left, holds the miraculous flowering staff that showed him chosen for Mary, who stands on Earth's globe, blue-robed at the right. She, whom I badgered throughout adolescence with, please make him call, looks heavenward, the serpent under her feet. Before each statue, candles in red shock glasses, clink of a nickel into the tin box, lighters in sand, wish candle, begun from another already burning. Did I say wish? Prayer. The brown dress. This is again around the same age, maybe a little bit older. And I included this recently, this poem, The Brown Dress, um, for a reunion booklet at the college I went to because I thought it reflected the, that time of life so well for me in any case. The brown dress. That crooked smiling girl at the edge of the photograph they're handing around at reunion seems so distant from me, I'd deny her. But for the brown wool dress she's wearing, a dress I loved, she seems reluctantly part of the picture. Probably just heard a joke, more likely told one. The dress was new that year, I think, the hard year. I can't place this occasion where she's looking so pretty and scornful, so incredibly slender. But I want to tell her she'll grow out of the need for wisecracks and happily out of that dress, though she'll never find one she likes better. Cinnamon color, really. Leather belt, three quarter length sleeves. And one of the th discoveries I made, and, and part of what I was thinking in putting this reading together is that the writer discovers as he or she writes, but also as she, he or she puts a collection together, what it is they really say, you know, what our themes are. Um, and I realized there are an awful lot of people in this. Mara, uh, who wrote a very nice blurb, brought this out, that the, the book is full of uh, portraits of people, not to mention the, the main um, Maureen that I write about. But one of the people that appears in several poems is my grandfather, whom we call Papa, who is real part of familias. He had nine children and I'm one of 40 cousins. And he was very loving, a lawyer in Boston, full of a great sanguine love of life and love of the people. Uh, he thought we were all wonderful looking and everything. Um, so this poem, and so I realized that this manuscript ended up with three poems about Papa, and I'll read two of them tonight. Dropping in on Papa, and I'm about the same age as the brown dress here. Dropping in on Papa. What had he on his schedule that day that he so courteously left to come forward from his desk and hold me close? He took me to the Parker House for lunch. We sat in the high ceiling dining room with its fine platter of china bending waiters, ladies in big hats. Then we went to Bailey's, where he bought me chocolates. I'm going out now with my lovely granddaughter. He nods to Miss O'Day, with him for 30 years, who was too prostrate to attend his funeral. She hurries off to cancel, rearrange. On our way back to Milk Street, Papa handed me small fortune, a check for $25. The memory now so clear and somehow blue it lets me see exactly what I bought with it. A Liberty blouse, you had to have one then, in a print of violets with a round collar. I guess clothes were incredibly important in those days to us. I'm gonna read now the, uh, the title poem, which is a, the Maureen Papers, which is actually um, a sequence of short sketches that attempts to give a biography of a, of a person, my sister-in-law, um, late sister-in-law, I'm sorry to say. A wonderful person, funny, a bookish person, a nurse, strong, with a heart, who'd had a hard life, but who was a wonderful friend to me. I should also add that another discovery in this, I realize is in reading it, is that it's a biography of Maureen, perhaps, a biographical, 
but of course it's autobiographical as well because I um, I come into it in so many ways as the friend or the listener or whatever. So uh, I'll read without comment the, the various sections of it. Um, and most of the poems are, they're all really addressed to Maureen, but in two or three of them, she herself is speaking. You may be able to realize that or I'll try to indicate it. You may pick up her voice after a while. So I'm addressing Maureen. You sign up for a massage at the, re excuse me, you sign up for a massage at the retreat center and make the mistake of saying you're a nurse. Whereupon the therapist starts to murmur, these hands that have healed so many, pressing and crooning, the burdens you bear, needing her own rhetoric, while head down on the frame you make faces at the floor. Take it home, you say, of a book I find in the guest bedroom. I'm getting rid of them, using too much space as it is. Later, want to go into town? There's a new book place on Chapel Street. Discounts, you never know. I like to poke around. But I meant it, take that one home. You swerve off the sidewalk into any Goodwill store to pull at the musty jackets, emerge with picture frames or a couple of placemats. All summer, yard sales seriously slow your drives up the coast. Before my first trip to London, you make sure I know there's a great and permanent flea market in Camden Town. Sundays in summer, you take your coffee and the Times crossword out to the deck, to the warmth, and tackle the puzzle swiftly, while whichever disagreeable cat is in residence then, or just hanging around because you feed it, follows the slightest movements of your pencil hand through sun-blinkered eyes. And this is Maureen herself talking. The things people say at funerals, we are leaving on daisies. It's a nice day for it. And that man, Peg's neighbor talking, talking. I thought we'd never escape. But he's so kind, Peg told me just now. He brought lovely fruit, you know, from his store when Ed was sick. I'd bring fruit too, I thought, if it let me bore people to death. Sometimes at a dinner party, when we'd be telling stories, you'd mention my brother, and I'd nod with the others following the narrative, the joke, some opinion held by a relative stranger, and then with a start, I'd remember you had only one brother, and for 25 years I was married to him. I've done it, you'd say. I can do it. Why should I do it? A kitchen history in 12 words. But times when you felt you still must do it, you'd close and then open the refrigerator, take wrong items from the cabinet, replace, adjust, stir, sigh, and at last, shrug food onto the table like something to which you've given absolutely no thought. This is what you did. When I was trapped in that slurred and constant post-surgery monologue, steroid swollen with plans, beliefs, resolutions, projects, hopes, declarations, you set food before me, watched as I cut it into small pieces to illustrate my points, then sent me to bed where sleepless I watched Roman Holiday for its universal truth that I'd always remember as guides to my life. And when I told you all about them next day, you listened. I know who did all this, your father says to you, in the middle of the surprise 80th birthday party you'd spent months arranging for him. It was Bridie, wasn't it? She's a great girl. You swallow the retorts of a lifetime. Pat his shoulder, no pop. It was me. Ah, oh, was it now? And I never suspected. You're so busy, Maureen. But why did you choose this band? I'm a mess, you've been saying lately. I can't remember things. You always add, just as well. The closest you come to acknowledging the pain of years, mother suicidal, alcoholic husband, Daughter with AIDS, the car crash that took your oldest son. I'm a nurse, you said to me once, and still I didn't know or wouldn't see what was happening when Jimmy died, how they kept moving him down by degrees, emergency, surgery, ICU. I was, I don't know, dazed, I guess, 
thinking he'd wake, they could do something, just some broken bones, nothing internal. A nurse, for God's sake. I couldn't see. Your little house becomes a place where you can't be alone anymore. The soft lichen greens and yellows, prints you've placed so carefully, framed photos of your father's mantle with its philodendron clock and Irish flag. You have to get out of there, if you can open the door. That you called for my sake and at the last minute to say we couldn't meet after all. You were returning right away to Texas to stay with your daughter. Now seems, though I wept after, an enormous feat of strength in the face of inertia, a gathering of all your forces, so scattered, so self-approving, against the woe of life. For a long time, you and I had difficulty naming what we were to each other, ex, sister-in-law. In fact, we were closer after the divorce. In that desperate season, I got into my car and drove to New Haven to make very clear no way would I lose you. Sister-in-law, then, not ex. After years, you simplified. Friend. And this harks back to 2003 when we went to London together one time. This is the final in the series. We decided to leave the play at the National Theatre after the first act. And rather than look for a bus, we walked across Waterloo Bridge in glittering nighttime. Silver Thames, London Eye, like a constellation. We take the train over at Embankment Station. The city was ours. We didn't regret for a moment the waste of our tickets. We staked our claim. I want to read just two more poems after that uh, sequence. And here, my grandfather appears again in another city, this time New York. We now have Boston and Somerville and the first one and, and uh, London, now New York. I stayed in New York for several years right after college. And he came from Boston one time to, to visit me. This is called Love Makes the World Go Round. It's a quote from that song from Carnival. It's a prose poem. When I've climbed the four flights to the apartment, I go right to the window, and there he stands at the curb, my grandfather, Papa. It's so cold tonight when we spoke just now, getting out of the cab. White smoke came from our mouths. Papa waves, and I can tell he's saying, love, that he's relieved I'm back upstairs safely. What could have happened to me inside this little building? Yet there he's waited for my lights to come on. Circling in my head, Anna Maria Alberghetti's song in Carnival, the musical Papa took me to as a treat for a granddaughter living in a slum after that nice house in Brookline. But I only learn he thinks that later. And anyway, it's just a block in Yorkville, stony with cold, where from a window I watch as Papa gets stiffly back into the cab to return to his hotel. The last time I see him, I undress and go to bed, humming the Carnival music. Somebody soon will love you if no one loves you now. And finally, February 2020. I've still got love on my mind. February 2020. I get the Valentines out before breakfast, walking down the quiet street to the avenue sluggish with traffic. The crossing signal knocks overhead. I drop five valentines through the grudging slot of the new style mailbox. It accepts them, one by one. The pizza place at the corner is not yet open. The sky is unclouded for a change, the cold sun bright. Walking home, I decide to do this more often. Get out early and notice things, I mean, not just send love around. Though I tell myself these days to do more of that too. Thank you, folks. Uh, let's have another warm round of applause for Susan Donnelly. Next up, we have Richard Hoffman. He's published four volumes of poetry, uh, Without Paradise, Gold Star Road, Emblem, and his newer collection, Noon Until Night. 
His other books include the memoirs, Arthur House and Love and Fury, and the story collection, Interference and Other Stories. He teaches at Emerson College in Boston. So let's give a nice a round of applause for Richard Hoffman. Thank you. Uh, I like to start my readings with a poem by another poet. And in this case, I want to bring into the room the work of Stephen Dunn, uh, a, a friend, not a, not a bosom friend, but a companion uh, uh, who passed away a couple of weeks ago. So I want to begin with his poem, The Sacred. After the teacher asked if anyone had a sacred place and the students fidgeted and shrank in their chairs, the most serious of them all said it was his car. Being in it alone, his tape deck playing things he'd chosen and others knew the truth had been spoken and began speaking about their rooms, their hiding places, but the car kept coming up, the car in motion, music filling it, and sometimes one other person who understood the bright altar of the dashboard and how far away a car could take him from the need to speak or to answer, the key in having a key and putting it in and going. Stephen Dunn. Compañero, presente. And this is a poem called Vaccine. What is the word for the way the starlings sheen and the carapace of the Japanese beetle seem alike? And if I find it, will the dying stop? Words don't come easily to me. I used to think they were afraid of me. They hid in my chest, in my belly. Will the right ones make the dying stop? What word is there for the way some words unsaid erase you? For our hope to not hurt again. For what to say to make the dying stop? Now, uh, I live in Salem, Massachusetts, which is sort of the Halloween capital of the world. And this is a Halloween based uh, uh, poem. It takes its title uh, from a phrase from the Latin mass, meaning Lord have mercy on us. And the title, uh, uh, the word Sawin, spelled S-A-M-H-A-I-N, is Gaelic for Halloween when the veil between the living and the dead is said to be very thin. So this is Kyrie, October 31st, 2020. Sawin and a blue moon's near red Mars. The days grow shorter and more hard hours are added to our nights. The angel of history feels useless. She told me in a nightmare filled with the pornography of sadness and its delights. Sing Kyrie. Sing Kyrie eleison. None of us should suffer this darkness alone. Foundlings on earth, from hell or heaven, at night our shadows show us what will happen. And in the morning, rising, we become again their vital obstruction. Who abandoned us is a useless question, unworthy of all the arguing. Sing Kyrie. Sing Kyrie eleison. May all Earth's deadly resentment be done. The wind picks up and whistles in the woods. Days pass fast as breaks in hastened clouds. The angel of history shrugs and throws up her hands. I told you so. But what it was she told we'll never know. She speaks in tongues. Sing Kyrie. Sing Kyrie eleison. Restore our terrifying human minds to reason. Uh, 
I don't have much to say about these poems. I, I often try to, you know, make little notes for myself so that I can um, engage in between the poems. But, uh, but this particular selection, for whatever reason, uh, I think it, I'm just going to read the poems. This is called Addict. As a child, I saw faces convulse in disbelief and silent mourners at graveside in black coats quake under bowed heads. And I believed I understood how to heal us all, but couldn't. I was only a child. So I made myself sick over and over to have an excuse if ever I was asked if I could remember what I thought love had charged me to do. And this is called Dialogue. My brother's graves are far away, so I went to a nearby cemetery to speak with some other dead, because the dead are all the same and laugh that same bitter laughter, as if my need to understand why I am alive and my brother's dead is foolish anywhere, and though they know, they will not tell me. Now, this is a, a pretty new poem. Um, I'm trying it out on you, so. Uh, We'll see how it goes. It's called a weathered boat. In the cove, in brackish mud, in blowing reeds, sun on the flashing water is a weathered boat. I'm here, bewildered where my limits left me. The wind smells of salt and of fires far away. What if this is only the memory collecting part of a pilgrimage to a tragic but revealing context. I can chart day's speed with a stick in the ground, but night is more perplexing and I am frightened. There is shelter, but it takes too long to get there. None of the canceled animal generations made it. I hope these will be ancestral times for someone, a demonstration, all this blood, of what not to do. I don't believe there is a plan, but there's a shape. That cormorant disappearing for a fish knows that. My eyes have roamed in yours as deeply as I can. If ending is beginning, I'll be waiting for you there. So here's another car poem. Uh, it's called, I Don't Recall Where We Were Going. When we set out, the downpour was so loud, I didn't hear you ask if we should pull over. I'm sorry. The child in the back seat followed a rivulet's path down the window as if instructive. And the wipers, struggling to keep up, said life is luck and love and love and luck and luck and love as I tried to stay on the road, torrents pouring across it, great fans of water slapping us from gigantic trucks roaring past. I dared not turn and look at you. I never was so frightened or alive. Um, this is a poem called Impenitent Thief. Once a young woman heard a baby's cry coming from the house of death. Bloodied and fierce, she entered, snatched the child, and barely made it out of there, the two of them alive. Dear child, you are mine, she whispered rocking the sleeping infant in her arms. Older, hurt by words, 
The child would turn and plunge into her like someone on fire into a pool of water. You are my child and I am your mother, the woman would sing, soothing the child. But she had never forgotten. No mother has ever forgotten from whom she'd stolen it. I realized when I was putting these poems together, there's a little bit of a theme of hopelessness in them. And I, and I mean that in a, in a positive way. Uh, I think of the word disillusion, uh, of being disillusioned, uh, which is hard. It's hard to be disillusioned, but at the same time, uh, it's important to let go of the illusions. Um, this is called last hope. If you ever come, my dreamed of world, the one we almost had, I will be gone with all the others. After all of this waiting on wooden benches outside in the hall, after the clicking of heels on polished tile, after the furious shuffling of papers and the endless arguments over money, bring with you people refreshed by love, disposed to wonder, surprised at cruelty. Improbable world I once believed in, rising from words like steam from a bowl of soup. World like an egg in a nest of the best debris. If against all odds you take shape one day, bring people whose hearts are less hesitant, new people, better people than we were. I have been tinkering with this poem and um, a good friend who's here this evening, Tom Malouk, uh, a wonderful poet, uh, helped with this poem. It's called Cold Comfort. Tonight the harbor is the sea. Waves thunder, detonate on rocks, slosh over the seawall. The glaring moon has dissolved the stars. Few others are out, it is so cold. If I walk to the end of the pier in this eye-watering wind, boards shuddering under me, might I find what to say to my friends mourning their daughter? If this night has any advice, it's in a language I don't understand. My children are alive and healthy. How can my words not hurt? Question is a cloud of breath. This is an older poem uh, called Hatteras Sunset. Breakers boom on the sand. A gull tumbles in a crosswind, writes himself, then glides in oblique and waning light. What does what I want have to do with anything here? What is, is, and also its brief moving shadow was. Now this poem uh, is the, uh, the freshest. Um, I just, uh, I actually finished fooling around with it today. It's a villanelle, it's called Not This Time. I see you, Hope. Oh no, you don't. You ghost in my arms, you anodyne, you elsewhere. Again, you've left me counting the cost of my credulity thwarted, double-crossed. What fool expects the world to be fair? I see you, Hope. Oh, no, you don't. You ghost ship once more making for the rocky coast of desire strewn with wrecks. Don't you dare. 
Again, you've left me counting the cost and trying to decide which part hurts most, my friend's duplicity or this despair. I see you hope. Oh, no, you don't. You ghost me over and over, tease me with almost and nearly, but leave me neither here nor there. Again, you've left me counting the cost to my spirit, my will, my confidence, lost to empty promises, my trust beyond repair. I see you, Hope. Oh, no, you don't, you ghost. Not this time, you liar. Get lost. I have just a couple more poems. This is called They That Mourn. Blessed are they that remember. For them, the muscle of the heart is twisted, looking as if it is turning away or trying to. And what it turns from is both particle and wave emitted from past disaster, but illuminating nothing. Theirs is more than remains. And blessed are the angry yet kind that mourn the animals and weep for the burning trees that roar at the roaring flames and worry few tears before were real as these that turn the light out, let the night in and contend with sorrow, that imagine what once they are gone, they might wish to have done and in that darkness begin. I'm gonna close with a little poem that uh, is called Motet. I have been really fortunate in having my poems set to music by a number of composers. And that really is exciting and, and wonderful, usually, sometimes. But really, uh, it's made me think about uh, the music in the poems again. And motet is a, uh, it's a form from uh, liturgical music of the Middle Ages. Uh, and a motet is sung by a, a, a choir and, and it is often like a round, you know, like row, row, row your boat. I, I, and I had that in mind here. I have thinking about this for four voices. Um, where each of the discrete lines would be sung by a different voice and, and then they would continue to overlap and the, the motet would roll on. Of course, a real composer might have completely different idea about that. That was just what was my thinking as I wrote it. So I'll conclude with this motet. The days yield each to the next. No one is finally victorious. Life is language lived and loved. Kindness is our need and duty. In English, the name of God is 26 letters long. Life is language lived and loved. Kindness is our need and duty. No one is finally victorious. The days yield each to the next. Life is language lived and loved. Kindness is our need and duty. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Richard. That was great. Really enjoyed some of those powerful imagery. The next uh, uh, featured poet up is Christine Tierney. Her first book is Chicken and Lower Case Equals Fleur, was recently published by Lily Poetry Review Books. Her poems and flash fiction have appeared in 14 Hills, Poet Lore, The Yalabusha Review, The Tusculum Review, Primafrost, Sugar House Review, and other great places. 
she holds an MFA from the University of Southern Maine Stone Coast, and uh, she uh, writing program and a BA in uh, film from Emerson College. She is a photo artist, music lover, and wannabe comedian. So please welcome Christine Tierney. Thank you so much. This is my new book. Cover right. art. <laughs> cover art done by uh, Martha McCullough. Um, and it's chicken plus lowercase equals blur. It's kind of like a mathematical equation. Everybody always is like, what? Um, so anyway, thank you so much um, for coming tonight. And um, thank you to Gloria and Harris for having me. I'm really excited. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be reading from my new book. And the only thing that you need to know before I start <clears throat> is that I created um, a character for the book and her name is lowercase. And sometimes she is known as Elsie. So if you hear Elsie or lowercase, it's the female character created for the book. So I'll just start. This is called Scene. Scene. The woman in the kitchen plays mother. She rinses blood from a limp chicken and shakes a box of green flakes over raw potatoes. Out in the living room, lowercase gums the worn edge of a wooden block. If only the woman could step out of the kitchen, forget about the tuck and rub of the dead bird, manipulate a new prop, feign something unscripted with her hands. This is called The Ballad of Pinky Pinky Chicken. The Ballad of Pinky Pinky Chicken. Her belly holds me. I'm a nosy, nosy guppy. I spy as mummy mummy knits square after square of soon to be, soon to be Afghans. Daddy's pinto chortles up the street. A million tools rattle, rattle in the back. I kicky, kicky hard. I kicky, kicky, rock 'em, sock 'em, robot hard, and mummy, mummy drops her clacky needles in between the cushions of the couch. Mummy, mummy pats down the puff of her uncombed, uncombed hair and steals the last smidgen, smidgen of red rose tea from her pricey, pricey gold rim teacup when she hears daddy's brakes halt. Jangle, jangle go daddy's keys as he Godzilla stumps, stomps up the creaky, creaky front steps. Before daddy's mitt turns the handle of the warpy, warpy screen door, mummy, mummy drags me in her swollen belly to the kitchen where we quickie, quickie check on dinner. Mummy, mummy stabs the tarnished fork tines into the chicken's plumpy, plumpy, way too plumpy, why so plumpy breast and panics as the pinky, pinky juices ooze on out. I stop squirming, ungently nudging. And mummy, mummy cranks the heat up high. Crackle, crackle, spit, spit, smoke, smoke, more smoke. Daddy's in the archway, breathing fire, fire. This is called Tangle. Tangle. Their glum world was the inside of Count Chocula's coffin, tasseled ghost pink housecoat, and bitten sticks of Wrigley spearmint gum bronchial and inflamed, their tongues coated in a cable knit of lonesome. If only they were taught how to leave the last smidgen of frosting in the fractured bowl. Big girl snatching fleecy snippets mom tore from the vexed bowl. Dad kneeling on that clammy lawn, praying for the right-sized wrench to fall from Mary Kay smirched sky. Dottie's sponge curlers reeked of living room shag and the living room shag reeked of hug me and I'll go postal. Then came the coterie of bougie mums, wielding their fiercely mayoed salads and celery eye cream, gawking like bulls at the heaps of charred Legos and KFC wet naps, shrouding the linoleum like germicidal petticoats. This is called Not That Game. Fragments of elk stirring in the soft wood paneling. He'd pin her down on the scratchy green shag, 
grab her by the cheeks with his blonde hooves and stretch them until the bitty cracks on her lips split wide. Say putty tat. She'd fight it. Say putty tat. She'd twist and squirm, jerk her head from side to side. Say it, pig, or I'll stop, and I'll stop. He'd lower a milky line of drool from his stormy metallic mouth and then suck it back up before it landed. The smell, the gunky bits stuck in between, the weight of a boy's boundless fury draped across the length of her. This was not that game. He was not the boy who stopped. If you don't say it, I'll punch you. He was no dumb buck, knew where to hide his bronco marks. Sometimes she'd end up saying it, mostly not. Either way, his hot, acrid breath, brute bone clutes, landed on her anyway. This is called Y8. Y8. So, if mean pervy Gerald dropped a gardener snake down the back of your tucked in t-shirt, you'd what? Call the pigs? Maybe you'd scream like a big old pussy or flap your arms around like a wuss bag. Not LC. She's that rusted frickin' lock on Mr. Migalachi's door that no one in the neighborhood can pick. She's that gargantuan rock with the spray-painted smiley face dicks that the Marlboro light-puffing posers make out on. See, even when the majorettes were chanting in Elsie's head, hey, hey, fatties don't tuck in. No, no, fatties don't tuck in. She didn't move one flabby muscle. She counted in eights instead. Eight stabs of light from between the branches of the turd tarred trees, eight snaky thrashes against her velveteen love handles. She thinks she even counted eight little snickers from her douchey cousin Kate with the titmouse feet who rubbed her smelly spit against her double jointed thumb declaring soul sisters forever. But what stands out most about that day mean pervy Gerald dropped that goddamn gardener snake down the back of Elsie's tucked in t-shirt is how for at least eight friggin' minutes after she hit the deck, she tasted something like blood and cheese curls eddying around in her shit shy mouth. This is called the darker, the darker. She could tell you a thing about feeling like there are no feelings, about summertime and dandelions, about weeds that she called poppies, weeds that she called space suds that sprung up all over a father's patchy lawn. She could confess that she called calla lilies, tiger lilies, and vice versa, and how the green whips jutting from their middles reminded her of sour apple bubble gum. She could tell you a thing or two about wearing ribbed polyester shorts when everyone else had moved on to denim, about the difference between pig and ponytails, how one was pulled tight to expose your fat face and the other hung loose on your shoulders so you could breathe and chew taffy without headaches. She could write a book about a brother who could make so much noise about how much she weighed, tell you how every fight ended with her fat, and how back then that was all it took to end everything. If she wanted to, she could tell you how it felt to sit in the dark of some broken down closet and think of every single comeback. She could tell you, no, she could whisper, how in the absence of light, fat becomes nothing more than heat. This is called sunflowers holding out. Sunflowers holding out. On Thursdays, they come to lowercase and beg, staggering on their, their gooey stalks. Water, one cries, sun, another. She knows what they want and refuses. They feign with their marigold wisps craning to and from the light. She waits as, there's, as their necks sag and their peach sop spines reek. They are not fit for this kind of heat. Just tell me why I want to hurt you, lowercase demands. A grudge on each face, a sphincter clamped and not one single petal released. Pathetic, snarls lowercase. They smirk, complain, and furl their gunky gills as she drags their sludge muck vase to the center of the darkening room. 
This is called another pitiful tribute to chicken. Another pitiful tribute to chicken. One, lowercase was raised on jaundiced chicken. Two, lowercase's mom was a sick moth in a quilted pink bathrobe that smelled like Vicks vapor rub and white shoulders dusting powder. Three, lowercase heard her older brother tell her older sister he wished the stupid chicken could at least be fried once in a while. Four, Lowercase's mom might have had all kinds of beautiful inside her, but who the hell knew? Five, all Lowercase's dad did was bark at Lowercase's mom. Get a friggin' job down at the bus stand, goddamn bus station with me. The last place on earth a sick moth could hold a friggin' job. Drained and weary, Lowercase's mom tore off to Arkansas in her 67 convertible Mustang with the kicked in taillight while Lowercase was out raking leaves with her friend Betty. Seven, the day Lowercase's mom split, Lowercase's dad dragged a mound of sallow chicken out into the living room. Eight, Lowercase's, Lowercase's older brother got the biggest piece and Lowercase's older sister got seconds. Nine, lowercase fed her measly scrap of rank chicken to the, le to the leg humping dog. And this is my final piece. It's called Like a Canker, It Came Running. Like a Canker, It Came Running. That was the spring she decided. A plan unraveled from inside her. She tricked all the mirrors, nicked them with kitchen knives, made parts of her pay. She came close to lopping, grabbed fistfuls of droopy hip and just squeezed. There was so much shoved in that begged to come out. It wasn't supposed to last. What starts out as seed, even sickly sponge soppy seed blooms. It got so bad that the knives rebelled and dulled and she was forced to use her teeth, even the yuck, mucky, rotten ones. Teeth against glass. When her teeth were all gone, pared down to grim nubs, she plucked out the bones in her sore and sorry mouth. One by one, she washed off the ticks and meat, ticks of meat and dark, moussey cake, dried them by the mushrooming fire. She spent more than a fortnight sharpening her bones into stick pens shaped like her anger. It was fun. It was yummy fun. Then one afternoon, when the dastardly world was at work, she jabbed each and every one of those bones into her fatty, fatty heart. That's it. Thank you so much. Let's have another round of applause for our three features. Susan Donnelly, Richard Hoffman, and Christine Tierney. So now we come to our Q&A section. So um, there are two pages. I can only see the first page. Um, but if you have any questions for the readers, um, uh, please uh, start. Well, hi, this is David. Um, well, first of all, I mean, of course, I want to thank uh, all three readers for a really invigorating and and varied evening. Um, it's it's it, there's been quite a range of uh, powerful work here. So, I have a, a question though for Christine. Um, um, now I, I've been lucky enough to hear you uh, read a number of times, and I've read the book too. Um, but I'm curious. Could you say a little bit about like the What's what's Laura Case's origin story, <laughs> or some version of that question, if you don't mind? I'm curious about that. Um, what do you mean her origin story? I guess I'm not really sure what you mean. Yeah, that's sort of a coy way to put it. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, I you know, you, one could ask, like, you know, where flatter versions of that question for me is like, where did she come from? How did it get started? Um, I mean, it's sort of like, how did this begin? Um, yeah, like maybe that's it. Okay. Um, so I've been working on these pieces for a while. 
Um, and I had kind of put, uh, put everything on hold for a while. And, um, and I started to, to rework uh, the manuscript. Um, wait, what am I trying to say? So, so may, wait a minute, let me, let me, so, so this, this book came out at a time when I did not expect a book to come out of me. So anyone that wants to put a book out, um, I was at the Boston Poetry Marathon and I read on the open, well, uh, I read, and, Mar and, and um, Eileen approached me afterwards and said, so do you have a manuscript ready? And, you know, I had worked on different manuscripts and I was like, oh yeah, of course, you know. And so um, I hope she's not here. <laughs> I don't even know if she knows that. And so I, you know, I started to work on my manuscript and fine tune it and um, lowercase evolved from that. Um, and so, yeah, and then this book, came out and um but anyway i don't mean to go on and on so so lowercase the, the the character lowercase is how i describe the book which is it's a female character who has a lot of self-confidence issues family issues and the reason that i came up with lowercase is because that's exactly who she embodies most of the time is that she just doesn't even feel that she deserves it uh, a capital letter you know in front of her name so that's that's how it started. When I looked at the manuscript, that evolved. Anyway, I don't mean to keep going on and on about it. So that's my story. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Christine, I just want to say um, your book, it was so full of surprises and twists. Thank you. And um, I just didn't know what to expect as I read. And I loved that. It was just really wonderful. So congratulations. Thank you. You know, sometimes when things happen, happen a little later on in life, I think it's a good thing all around. And I just think I also am a firm believer that things happen when you least when you when you least expect it, you know, so For yeah. Sure. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question? Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, Bernadette. Bernadette. Hi, uh, thank you very much for a wonderful reading. I did like um, as David had said, the diversity of the three poets. Uh, my question, though, is to uh, Richard Hoffman. Richard Hoffman. Um, the poems that you read, uh, I really loved. And some of them were not that many lines. And I'm wondering how you know when I said all that I have to say here. And the second question is, who are some of the poets who you really liked? Well, thanks for that question. Um, well, the poems start out uh, larger than they end up. Um, I keep squeezing them. You know, I'm trying to, they are sopping and dripping when, when the first draft is done. And then I keep squeezing, trying to get everything out of them that isn't really, that they're, it doesn't belong. And so that, that idea of compression, I think is at the heart of lyricism because you, what the poem won't start to sing as long as it's talky. And that's, it, you know, that's what I'm after in, in my poems is something that approaches um, songs. And uh, the only way to do that is to keep, keep saying, no, no, that, that whole phrase is too much. You can do that with this one adjective or you, you know, and continually uh, squeeze out um, anything that isn't necessary. And then a kind of music emerge, emerges that you follow. Um, and uh, there are so many poets I, I love uh, and across a wide variety of writers. Right now I'm reading this beat writer, Bob Kaufman, uh, who was always considered sort of a lesser beat poet because of the celebrity of people like Allen Ginsberg and Gary Snyder and, and oh my God, this guy, you know, and then some people dismissed him as a, a surrealist. Yeah, well, if you like that kind of, he's a visionary and I'm reading his collected poems right now and I'm, and I'm thinking, how did I, how did I miss this guy? You know, uh, all the decades I've been reading poetry and 
how did I miss this guy? And then, uh, you know, I mentioned Stephen Dunn who passed away. I, Stephen would hate that. I, he died two weeks ago. <laughs> I, mean, I know Stephen pretty well and he would have hated somebody saying he passed or he, he died. Um, and um, his work is, is just remarkable. Um, I picked that poem because it was short and it actually, in a, I think features what Stephen does best, which is to start out with something that's completely mundane and, and not, you know, not take off like, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos into the outer, into outer space, but, but to, to torque the, the experience he's writing about in just such a way that it, it continues to resonate at the end of the poem. Um, and then it's called, then you realize, yes, it's called the sacred, but that suggests some big, uh, you know, transcendent uh, understanding. And his understanding of the sacred is in that poem and it's in the everyday and it's in the places we go to be alone and it's in solitude. And, and so he's another poet. Uh, a poet I'm crazy about is Linda McCarriston, who hasn't published in a while. Uh, her book, Eva Mary, was a real breakthrough book. Uh, a book about growing up in working class Lynn, Massachusetts, and, um, and being an incest survivor. That, that is a very limiting way to talk about the beauty of that book. It's so powerful. I would recommend it to anybody, Eva Mary. It was a, a finalist for the National Book Award in 93. So that's, there's three poets. I could, I mean, I just, I read across a wide range of, of poets and, and, um, and yeah, it's, it's like my musical tastes are similar. You know, sort of like if, if I like it, I like it. But could I just ask, could you spell her last name? M-C-C-A-R-R-I-S-T-O-N. McCarriston. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Uh, Tom? Oh, were you raising your hand? Yeah, go ahead, Tom Malik. Yeah, I, I did raise my hand, thank okay. you. Um, I'm delighted to have been here. I usually run out of the room as soon as the last poet is done, but it was such an effective reading. I just wanted to hear what other people had to say, as well as raise a question with Richard about, you, to some extent you answered it about um, the music in your poems, but I'd like to hear you elaborate on the relationship between voice and music. We've, you and I have had conversations about this concept of voice and uh, I continue to find it an elusive notion, but it's clear to me that certainly in tonight's reading, you know, the sound and the voice were, were wedded to each other, uh, both in all the poets, I thought. Um, I loved Christine's irreverent, you know, humorous, vulgar uh, riffing. Um, so I just wanted to ask you what your thoughts are about the relationship between voice and sound. Well, I, it's interesting because, thanks for that question, Tom, I think. <laughs> um, first of all, that people talk about the, a poet's voice, a poet, poet finding their voice. And I, and I honestly think that that's a load. That's a load of crap. <laughs> to me, it's the, the poem that's emerging on the page has a voice and you're trying to find it. And it may be nothing like the voice of the poem that you wrote last week or last month or last year. You're in service to the poem that's trying to come into the world. And uh, that's the only way to, you know, whether or not you think that's, that's, true in a literal sense or, uh, you know, or not, it's still the way to relate to the work as it's trying, 
it is that you're helping it come into the world and you're not saying, what is this thing? What kind of a thing is this? How, what kind of a song is it? And then it has a voice. And maybe over time, and I think this is, I, I mean, I think about, um, you know, Stephen Dunn again with something like 20 books and I go back and there's a, there's a through line that you, you could, you pick up those books, you read one of those poems if you know his work. I, I think that's, you say, I think that's a Stephen Dunn poem. You know, you hear something in it. But I don't think the poet can know that ahead of time without becoming incredibly self-conscious and worrying about their place in the poetry world and all that other nonsense. I think that, you know, this little wriggling thing that's in your notebook that you're trying to bring to fruition, you know, you, you, you I don't know, you massage it, you water it, you do whatever it's, that has a voice and that's what you're trying to hear. And I don't think it's your voice, only, it's only your voice in retrospect when someone else looks and sees all that. Right, what's the screen? Um, yeah, so, and then, I mean, as far as reading them, if you're talking about like the personal voice, like Susan reading and Christine reading and my reading this evening, I think uh, that you have to practice that. I th you know, you do. I, I, I think it's like playing an instrument. You know, just because you know how to read music and you know what all the notes are and you know how to, you still have to practice it to get it to sound like uh, it should sound. Oh, and not huh. like, well, I, I, I just want to say all the notes, you know. You know. One of the things that I appreciated most about this reading was that it wasn't a reading. It was a telling, mm. and there's a big difference. Mm. I want to, I want people to tell me their poems. I hear you. I and hear you. if you just read it off the page, something's lost. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Harris, will you mute yourself? I think he's frozen. <laughs> but, um, now you've uh, done it, Gloria. That's probably why he made that noise. He's frozen. <laughs> Sorry, Harris. <laughs> um, no. Oh, well, now he's. But you know, I would, I would, I would love to hear uh, Susan or and Christine, you know, address that question if if you if you have a, a mind to either of you. I think it's a rich. It's a rich question. I, I will, but I have to have the question repeated again. Something about the voice, or uh, but what is what was the question of the difference of, of voice and? Go ahead, Tom. You want to repeat your question? I was wondering about the relationship between sound and voice in a poem. So, like you know, when I listen to Richard's poems, I hear. It comes from this experience that I, I could never read until I was about 11 or 12 years old. And because, because of that, I sub-vocalize everything I read. So I'm always hearing words in my head. They don't exist on the page. I can't, I can't separate the sound of a word from its uh, digital there? representation on the page. And so, well, oh. and I've been sort of, you know, the word voice and the word sound sound like they have something to, go, to do with each other. Well, I, I guess I'm um, not quite sure how to answer that, but um, I, I think I would say that I, I kind of disagree with Richard in the sense that I think you were saying that voice doesn't mean much or something like that. Because I guess what I was what I was trying to say in tonight's reading, I don't know whether it's voice or not, oui. but I was trying to say that um, in in compi the reason I read a poem from Transit Chanson on the Red Line was because I thought that carried the themes that I perforce it seemed would would keep bringing in different ways into my work and in spending a lot of time trying to put together a manuscript this latest one. And then discovering that there was that same person, you know, maybe younger, maybe older, 
but in some ways still a person standing on the subway platform, very much a lover of cities, very perhaps romantic, I suppose. Um, and so in that sense, I, I do see it as a kind of voice um, of, of my own, but it's not that, I, that I'm listening. I understand what you're saying. Every poem you have to come to recognize whether it really is a poem or whether it's in the way you'd say something, I guess, you know? Um, so that's what I basically have to say about voice. Thank you. Um, so that'll conclude for tonight our Q and A. <laughs> and um, so to close out, I wanna thank all of you for coming. And can we have another round of applause for the readers? You guys were wonderful tonight. So thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you, Harris. And um, so thank you. And that's it for now. Thanks, thank everybody. you, Gloria. Good night.